I think it's uh, I think it's time to get started. Uh, so uh, uh, one thing that's missing from that is uh, just an outline, which I thought was kind of useful for today, as I'll be sort of running all over the map uh, on this thing. So the first. Uh, thing I'm going to start out with is uh, sort of the current lineup of the large language models uh, of AI so that you can see uh, what's out there. And uh, I'll go through some potential benefits of AI to society. <clears throat> Contrast between oh, what uh, I, I see Google DeepMind doing and Microsoft uh, Open uh, AI. Uh, and, uh, uh, to me, it's a bit troublesome. Uh, then uh, a list of the uh, potential harms to society, uh, a, 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 some uh, stuff about uh, regulation of AI, which is now getting uh, underway. And uh, at the end, I'll sort of close with a summary view of my own of uh, uh, where I am seeing this stuff going. So uh, this is a, uh, a, a map uh, of the large language models uh, of AI uh, that are out there. And you see, they really didn't get underway till something like about 2018, when that uh, idea of uh, how, how to make word vectors and embed them uh, in such a way uh, that a neural net uh, could uh, uh, process them and, and come back with rather human-like uh, things. So you see it all starting out here with word to vec, and then various branches taking uh, taking place with most of the uh, branches uh, coming up through decoder owner uh, only uh, things. And uh, what you see here is uh, in a way maybe a bit frightening. Uh, there, this uh, this uh, uh, OpGLM uh, is a Chinese uh, version uh, of an AI program. Then this is a sort of fancy uh, uh, thing uh, that uh, Google is working on, Google DeepMind. Uh, then uh, Meta, uh, the uh, company that over that uh, uh, oversees Facebook, uh, then Bard, which is a uh, Google's uh, chat uh, GPT, then the one we know the most about, Chat GPT four, Jurassic two is also a Chinese. Uh, uh, version uh, of AI, and Claude is a, uh, uh, a version, uh, an American version. So you see, it, it, the, the scene seems to be at the moment dominated by, uh, by China and, and the very large uh, US companies, uh, Google, uh, <coughs> Microsoft, uh, Meta, uh, and uh, those are the principal players uh, in, in, in that game, and uh, they have all sort of more or less evolved along the the, the trees uh, as uh, as shown here. Several Chat GPT uh, uh, is an open source, uh, so these are. Uh, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. The colored lines uh, are are open source. So uh, uh, Chat GPT uh, was uh, open source for a while, but by the time it got to uh, uh, Chat GPT, it became a closed source. And similarly uh, with uh, Chat GPT four. So most of these are are. Uh, are, are, are closed sources uh, that you can't uh, really do all, all that much with. <clears throat> so, 
I, I, here are the benefits to society. And, and I have to admit that I'm rather, you know, unimpressed by this list. And, and so, uh, uh, though it is not insignificant, uh, there is a reduction in, in human error. Uh, is uh, that uh, obviously computers are more accurate and precise than, than humans are, when, especially when they're programmed uh, correctly. Uh, and uh, a beautiful example of this is robotic surgery, well, which can uh, uh, basically perform complex procedures with great uh, precision and using uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, <coughs> transducers that are available to it uh, can really uh, just see what's going on on a very microscopic level. Uh, then, of, of course, it uh, can allow humans to uh, uh, avoid very risky environments and, and getting uh, the information that they need to uh, figure out what to go, or what to do about it, such as diffusing a bomb or going into space, exploring the deepest parts of the ocean. And, uh, and obviously, machines with metal bodies can survive uh, unfriendly environments. Uh, and uh, uh, this one, a fully automated pr production line in a manufacturing facility with robots performing all the tasks uh, end up eliminating the risk of human error and, and injury in, in uh, hazardous environments. Well, uh, that's... Uh, uh, really nice, but maybe the people whose jobs are being eliminated uh, don't feel quite so positive about that. Then it's availability. Presumably, computers don't get tired or bored, so uh, they're available 27, uh, uh, 20, 24, 27, uh, and uh, uh, you can uh, get unsatisfactory online customer support uh, 24 hours a day. <laughs> uh, and uh, obviously, uh, digital, it, it can provide great digital uh, assistance for, uh, for people who are uh, sort of, uh, what should I say, uh, limited in their capacity uh, to uh, quantitatively evaluate things. Uh, then new inventions, uh, uh, I, I uh, will mention uh, some that I am found actually rather uh, impressive. The idea that uh, you can make unbiased decisions, uh, that is decisions uh, that are presumably uh, undriven by emotion, uh, might be good, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, at, at least it would be, in a sense, uh, un 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 unbiased. It isn't clear that sometimes our biases aren't helpful. Uh, repetitive jobs, daily applications, risky situations, and medical applications. It, Pew, uh, the research opinion center, uh, convened a bunch of experts this year and uh, really ask them uh, to uh, talk about the future benefits and, and harms of AI uh, up through 19, uh, up through 2035. And uh, I, I thought that was a, a sensible perspective for them to take. They uh, basically were uh, uh, impressed by the power of digital enhancements and a whole bunch of things like medicine, health, et cetera, uh, and uh, <clears throat> access to I I information. The, somehow, this is an extraordinarily optimistic view. The benefits to human rights, uh, they assume it gives people the ability to access the kind of information that might help them to better uh, make their case, uh, but on the same, uh, on the opposing side, of course, it, it makes to, available to those who, who would try to interfere with people 
uh, 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 doing that uh, to get in the, get in their way. Uh, they, they see the benefits to human knowledge, and uh, they're all, all and they think of that in terms of innovation in business models, in local and national global standards and regulations, and in societal norms. Uh, rather strange to me that they didn't think of it in terms of human knowledge in, in more basic uh, is issues like uh, learning much more uh, scientifically. Uh, so uh, I, I, I was somewhat unimpressed by that list uh, that uh, people came up with in thinking about what were going to be the benefits. <clears throat> so it appears to me at this time that Google's deep mind is the leader, in my mind, uh, of, of the people uh, involved in AI. It will release a, a model called Gemini in early 2024, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be an important advance. DeepMind's AI research is built on its own uh, tensor processing unit, uh, abbreviated as TPU. Those are chips that are especially good at doing fast matrix multiplication, which is just what you need for the neur those neural nets uh, to work uh, efficiently and effectively. Uh, there are three kinds of chips out there. Uh, you probably encounter these. CPUs, which are computer processing units, GPUs, which are graphics processing units. That's what most of AI is built on. And then the tensor processing units, uh, rather unique uh, to, uh, to Google. Uh, DeepMind has used those chips in some things we'll talk about, AlphaGo, AlphaFold, Google Bard, and genome. Uh, AlphaGo was the first American, uh, the first AI system, excuse me, to beat the world champion uh, Go player uh, in, in 2016. It has since uh, been beaten by an American human, Kellen Pellerin. It was quite interesting uh, that uh, he spent about a year trying to figure out what weakness uh, uh, AlphaGo had and, and uh, using what we humans are especially good at, deception. Uh, <laughs> he, he was able to actually be uh, AlphaGo uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure that error has been corrected in AlphaGo yet. So AlphaFold this is one of the impressive achievements. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, that uh, a Google DeepMind has, has achieved. Uh, AlphaFold is an open AI system that predicts the uh, folding of about 200 million proteins from their amino acid sequence. If you remember the way uh, proteins are formed in, in, in the living things is you uh, going referencing what the, the recipe that resides in your DNA uh, the ribosome ends up making a linear chain of amino acids uh, shown right right here and that linear chain uh, uh, over time uh, uh, actually relatively quickly undergoes a folding process and assuming a shape and uh, that shape is absolutely crucial for the role that that protein uh, is, is supposed to uh, carry out in your body, both in allowing it to combine with other proteins and in getting its job done. Uh, it, it takes on a mechanical shape and the fitting together of those things is terribly important. And the fold, that, that, that folding is a pretty subtle thing, the forces that are involved to uniquely cause this thing to always fold into the right shape. Uh, 
uh, is quite remarkable and has been a problem that uh, uh, one was unable to solve uh, uh, using uh, uh, the best physics and chemistry that we, uh, that we uh, understood. Uh, <clears throat> So AlphaFold provided the first computational model that can regularly predict protein structures with, accurate, with accuracy, even in cases where no similar structure is known. DeepMind validated this open uh, program, uh, AlphaFold, in a uh, 14th critical assessment of protein structure prediction. Those things are called CASP, and CASP, this was the 14th session uh, of those trials. I think it's up through 16 now. But in that, they de demonstrated accuracy competitive with experimental structures. And that means uh, the accuracy that they could use was about as good as you could actually measure. So, uh, as you might imagine, comparing uh, whether you predicted the shape of something very, very complex, uh, actually the way it is, you can imagine is a, a bit of a tricky game in, in, as to how you evaluate it. But at any rate, uh, it, it, it turns out the latest version uh, involves uh, incorporating the physical and biological knowledge about protein salt structure, leveraging multi-sequence alignments, and into the, the uh, uh, design uh, of a deep learning algorithm. Uh, this is a picture of the sequence of uh, what they uh, go through. Also, uh, Google Bard is, there, is, is the uh, DeepMind's chat competitor uh, with ChatGPT. It's reputed to be more friendly uh, and with a text that is easier to scan, but it has only about 10% of the clientele uh, that uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, has, which dominates the uh, the, the scene in in, uh, uh, in AI. DeepMind just published Genome. Uh, actually, they published it just uh, last last a uh, couple of weeks ago uh, on November 29th. It's an incredible undertaking and an achievement in, or, in inorganic chemistry. The final genome model actually predicts energies to 11 milli electron volts per atom, making up the, uh, uh, the crystal, uh, and improves the position uh, of stable predictions uh, to above 80% with, uh, uh, with structure, and 32% and, and if you just tell them what the elements that you're trying to put together is. And that is compared to just 1% that they were able to do it in, in, in previous things. This again is also uh, a thing they've made open and, and available to anyone who wants uh, to use it. So it, it, it genome pre uh, predicts, makes accurate predictions of structures with five, five elements uh, even though that wasn't part of their training because there really wasn't anything to train on. Uh, uh, providing one of the first means to efficiently explore this chemical space. So what we're talking about is being able to uh, figure out how you could take five elements, put them into a crystal structure, and that crystal structure would be stable at room temperature. Uh, in, 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 in open air. Uh, you can imagine how, how complex a problem that is and, and how vast the space to explore uh, uh, would be. Uh, down here we have uh, a, uh, a, a sort of a map. This is uh, the, the, the precision of stable prediction. Uh, this is before genome, just using straight material project uh, data. And then when genome came along, that uh, working with three elements 
uh, that improvement was made with six elements. We hardly even tried to uh, to do it. Uh, but again, uh, with something like 50% uh, success ratio, it can actually predict the stability uh, of, of, of compositions of crystals made up of six different uh, different elements. Uh, here's a map of the unique Gary, elements. Yes, sir. Question: How did they come up with that name, Gino? I have no idea. It's so misleading. Yeah, well, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, uh, here is uh, uh, the unique elements uh, that they uh, uh, have uh, ended up uh, uh, predicting. Uh, and uh, it's just quite impressive. Uh, what they've done. Now, that was impressive, but in the same paper, a companion paper, they n didn't uh, just do prediction in conjunction with the Berkeley uh, lab uh, National Laboratory. Uh, they set up an autonomous laboratory for the accelerated synthesis of novel materials. And, and so, they just set up a, a, a bunch of robots, uh, and over 17 days of continuous operation, the A Lab for Autonomous Lab realized 41 novel compounds from a set of 58 targets identified using uh, their uh, uh, genome uh, prediction. Uh, not only did genome tell you that it would be stable, but it gave you a recipe as to how you could put the stuff together. That is, what temperatures you needed to get these things to combine. And uh, the uh, uh, thing that was, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, amazing was that I think in of the 58 targets, uh, 35 of them, you just use the prescription that uh, the genome came up with. In, uh, and uh, there were six others that the, the prescription didn't work out. Uh, but the robots, by fooling around, were able to find six more. Uh, that uh, uh, worked out, and the paper, so they ended up then with 41 out of 58 things that they thought would be stable, uh, they ended up uh, actually being able to show you that they could you could manufacture it and it would be stable, and that manufacturing was done robotically. <laughs> it, it, to me, it was just, a, 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 absolutely amazing <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that this is uh, uh, just, it seems to me, an incredible advance. And so I, 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 I say, thus we see deep mind uh, advancing capability by appropriate use uh, of AI. And it seemed to me very different to what open AI and their sponsor, Microsoft, are up to. So this kind of goes back to a, a thing we uh, talked about actually in the second uh, in the second lecture. Uh, Microsoft's ch chief technology officer, Kevin Scott, reacting to a call for AI to slow down its pace of development and release, uh, uh, was concerned that technology's potential uh, to level the playing field uh, was being ignored. Uh, th there are lots of people who knew what they wanted a computer to do, but lacked the training uh, uh, to make it happen. He felt that AI, with its ability to converse with users in plain language, could be a transformative equalizing force. And then, if it was built with enough caution and introduced with sufficient patience. And, and uh, 
So the Microsoft Open AI uh, seems to be focused on sort of providing supportive assistance to individuals. Uh, if you remember, uh, the earliest example of this uh, goes back to uh, uh, early, early days uh, that Microsoft uh, had, and do you remember Clippy? Oh yeah. Yeah, when you would try to uh, write a letter, <coughs> uh, all of a sudden this creature would appear on the screen and say, oh, looks like you're trying to write a letter, can I help you? <coughs> and when Bill Gates saw that, he, uh, his remark was, Clippy must die. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, uh, Bill, uh, uh, in the, the, the piece uh, that uh, I think it was uh, uh, Lowell Seaver uh, showed me uh, uh, from Bill Gates seemed to be incredibly supportive of this idea that you would use AI to sort of become your personal assistant and help you to do all kinds of things. Yes? <clears throat> Well, I'd be sure you know in this morning, say, Seattle Times, it said you, that a person used it to talk to their dead relative. Uh, just so you know. Uh, well, that's wonderful. I believe that was unforeseen. They had the voice of your Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, there you go. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, a thing you could add to the uh, the list of ben potential benefits uh, uh, of it. Uh, now, uh, uh, there are rumors. This is, uh, I, I think, uh, especially interesting. I'll not read the the Bill Gates thing. Uh, it's uh, there for you to read to yourself and figure out whether you want that kind of assistant uh, uh, in your life. So there are rumors that OpenAI has come up with a, with a, with a big breakup, breakthrough called Q. Uh, do you remember Q in, in, in from Star, was it Star, I think it was not Star Wars. Star uh, Trek. Star, Star Trek. Trek. Yeah, Q was a super intelligent being uh, who was almost godlike. Well, he was, in a sense, godlike. And, and I, uh, I can't help but believe that that's where that name is coming from. And Q may become the basis for CPT-5. It is said that Q, Q, Q can reason and plan and can be viewed as reaching uh, artificial general intelligence and that's uh, serious serious stuff artificial general intelligence is what we have we have a very wide uh, 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 array of things that we know about uh, and AGI uh, is viewed as uh, being representative of human intelligence and achieving it uh, 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 would be quite a quite a thing. Interestingly, it is said that Q takes more time to answer complex questions. So rather than trying to uh, answer things that are hard right away, uh, Q takes its time and thinks about it, which is uh, what we do. And, and so it, it does uh, seem that maybe something is really happening there. Uh, now, uh, it, it, it is the capability of Q and the previous uh, and the previous AL, AI's board re, uh, reaction to it. Remember, they ended up firing Sam Altman uh, as the head of uh, as the CEO of uh, uh, Open uh, Open AI. Uh, uh, are, are claimed. Uh, as to the reasons behind their firing of Altman. <clears throat> the New York Times reported on a movement called Effective Acceleration. Uh, it's abbreviated as E slash ACK, and you just say it as EAC. 
And, and it takes a, a libertarian approach to the development of AI. At the present moment, it is viewed as a fringe movement that is combating those who worry about the safety of AI and want some form of regulation. Uh, change, switching topics slightly, the competition for national dominance uh, in AI is headed by the United States and China with significant participation from Europe, Japan, and other technologically uh, advanced countries. Each player brings unique strengths to the table. The US with its technical giant companies and lots of money and resources and its innovative ecosystem. China with its massive data pools and government support and Europe with an emphasis on the ethical, on ethical AI and, and a uh, rigorous research program. Here are, uh, I, I took this from the, the Harvard Business Review uh, uh, just very recently. These are the top ranked uh, AI nations uh, uh, by some uh, thing called train. Uh, uh, here at the very top is the United States, then China, and the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and you see so on down the line. The two dominant leaders uh, are uh, the United States and China. <clears throat> In the United States, the uh, driving force uh, is uh, in the private sector. Uh, the, uh, this is an astounding thing. The share in the biggest AI models has spiked from 11% back in 2010 to 96 point, uh, to 96% in 2021 and 70% of the PhDs in AI-related fields are employed in the private, by the private sector. The intense uh, competition among US AI players will likely continue to power the US lead uh, on, on the, in, uh, on the in innovation uh, dimension. It, it was uh, quite interesting to read in today's Wall Street Journal. Uh, a review of what's going on for the year and looking ahead. Okay. <coughs> the, uh, and uh, uh, that was a very aggressive article, uh, uh, though uh, much concerned that only something like 1% of the people trained in, in, in this business uh, in the United States is going into government. So the rest, of it's, most of it's going into the private sector. And, and uh, uh, that can be a concern because uh, uh, it would seem that government oversight uh, of this to some degree is going to be absolutely uh, necessary, necessary and important. Uh, <clears throat> So China, as the uh, largest internet-enabled population, and, and consequently uh, adaptation, can happen at remarkable rates. So for example, China's generative uh, AI program, ErnieBot, reached a million users in 19 hours. Uh, well, that took chat GPT five days. So <laughs> it's just an example of how high the computer literacy uh, uh, is uh, among the population uh, in China. Okay, so some potential harms. Uh, of course, one is bias and discrimination. Uh, the, A the AI algorithms are only as good as the data they, they are trained on, and of course the training the data they're trained on is what's out there and available. And uh, inadvertently, bias and discrimination uh, obviously creeps into uh, 
in, 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 into that data and could end up uh, uh, perpetrating itself into decisions that are made uh, via AI. Privacy and security, well, uh, AI is going to ha have to end up knowing an awful lot about you, and it wants to know an awful lot about you. And the issue of how you keep it, uh, uh, keep things private that should be kept private, uh, and it's a big thing. To me, this is probably the biggest uh, social concern that I have, the unemployment and job disruption uh, that uh, AI is apt to, uh, to, to create. We'll talk about that in a minute. Lack of transparency and accountability, that is, we're going to have trouble understanding what these systems actually can do. And I think even if we try to be transparent about them, they are sufficiently large and complex that you're not always going to be able to see your way through uh, what the outcome is. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> ethical considerations, uh, the use of uh, autonomous weapons or the potential for uh, AI systems to manipulate or deceive people. Uh, we, we, of course, have to deal with that uh, independently of AI. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful system in our own country that uh, uh, tries to deceive us and scam us and do things that uh, are really unpleasant and relieve us of our just desserts. Here again is that same group that I talked about earlier, the experts uh, and talking about future benefits and harms of AI through, nine, through 2035. Uh, and that was held uh, in June uh, of, of, of this year. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just let you uh, read those uh, at your uh, at, at your leisure, they are potentially uh, very serious. And you have to one has to pay attention to them. Uh, Google uh, DeepMind, in a recent article, uh, just listed the t t table uh, of autonomy level uh, and, and the corresponding uh, the corresponding list. And so, uh, running all, all, all the way from uh, uh, giving it no autonomy whatsoever, and you don't have to worry uh, at all because that's just what the status quo is, and, and all the way down to uh, fully autonomous uh, AI, and you uh, have to worry about the concentration uh, of power and. and a misalignment of its objectives with uh, the rest of humanity. Now, the regulation of artificial intelligence is getting underway in a serious way. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, the uh, U.S. the President's uh, executive order, safe, secure, and trustworthy development and the use uh, of artificial intelligence uh, was published. Uh, and uh, uh, here is just a list uh, of some of the important things that it, uh, it was going to attack. Uh, creating new safety and security standards for AI, uh, protecting your privacy, uh, trying to advance equity and civil rights, uh, protecting consumers, uh, workers, uh, promoting innovation uh, and, and working with international uh, partners to do, try to set up some kind of regulation and standards over the, through, around the world, developing guidance uh, for the federal, our own government's use uh, and procurement of AI uh, and uh, speeding up uh, our trying to uh, hire workers skilled in the field. There's been a couple of supporting things coming out 
from the uh, Office of Management and Budget. There's implementing guidance to this uh, uh, set of regulations in the President's executive order. And OSTP last year uh, sent out a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, that is, for individuals. In the European uh, Parliament, whoop, the European Parliament uh, has acted and come up with a uh, uh, what they call the Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, a deal on comprehensive rules for trustworthy AI, and again, uh, safeguards on the general purpose uh, of artificial intelligence. Uh, the limitation uh, of the use of biometric uh, identification systems by law enforcement. They seem especially sensitive to, the, to that. Bans on social scoring for uh, via AI to manipulate or exploit users. The rights of customers to complain. And rather serious fines, which uh, uh, the uh, the EU uh, is uh, quite uh, active in, in, in regulating, particularly on American firms. So here's my view of what this is all about. Uh, first of all, the thing to notice is none of the listed downsides uh, of AI addressed uh, robots taking over in the sense of either Terminator or Matrix uh, as a possibility. Uh, it, it, it is a possibility, uh, but in the very far future, if ever. The response of governments has been to write sensible regulations to attempt to keep AI in the service of humanity. Uh, my concern at the moment is the effect of AI and robotics on jobs. Looking at the issue globally, there are about 3.4 billion workers worldwide. Uh, and AI will likely make about a billion of their jobs obsolete over the next 10 years. Doing nothing and allowing the profits to accrue to the corporations that created the job loss would be a disaster because in addition to creating a vast army of unemployed, it would also, in, in many cases, deplete governments of the tax base that they need to uh, deal with the uh, fact that they have a whole army of unemployed they have to look after. AI and, and its sidekick, uh, robotics, offer both a promise and challenge of creating great wealth by taking over many of the tasks presently carried out by humans. In the view of AI and robotic corporations, they are providing customers with better and more efficient service, while the human worker sees his, life, his livelihood threatened. Progress often entails such trade-offs. Governments have to deal with the consequences uh, of that kind of crossly progress, and, and it, it entails their providing sustenance to the dislocated workers and, and their families, and training for jobs that are still in demand. How will governments come up with the necessary re resources to carry out such a responsibility? So the answer apparently would involve either taxing the companies employing robots, taxing the companies making the robots, taxing the entire digital enterprise, or uh, investing in AI companies and using the profits uh, that, that accrue to deal with any of the damage that AI uh, creates. None of these appear attractive to corporations in capitalist societies. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Enforcement of regulations on AI 
seems to me to be the issue, and will pre prove extremely difficult, if not impossible. Think about it, I like to think about it this way. Suppose we were dealing with a, uh, with a group of potentially powerful, hostile aliens. It would be critical that we would be united, that all of humanity be united in its stance in dealing with that threat. Currently, the competitive forces at play in, in the AI world make that kind of unity uh, very difficult to realize. Uh, I consider it unlikely. So I, I ask myself th th these questions that I'm sure many of you will not agree with. Do we need AGI right now? Remember, that's uh, artificial general intelligence. I say, no. <laughs> Will AGI happen? I say, yes. <coughs> but it would be best to allow its realization to take as long as possible. Uh, we might be able to have worked ourselves uh, into a, a, a state where we're better situated to deal with the potential downsides that would be created. Let's direct our present resources to getting global warming under control. How is all the wealth that AI promises to create to be distributed? Shouldn't that be given some thought? And hopefully humanity could come up with a plan before potentially creating any more poverty. So I fancy the idea of launching an international AI and robotics campaign to combat global climate change, increase efficiency, and bring down the cost of wind and solar. You notice in green here, I have maybe employ nuclear fission to provide the energy to directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere and sequester it down here. This is a list of a framework of all the things you could do to uh, use AI to combat climate change. And under removal is uh, the technological removal. Uh, the reason that you want to get nuclear reactors involved is that you need a lot of energy to drive the fans that would uh, try to grab and sequester CO2 out of the atmosphere. And of course, you have to generate that, that energy without uh, uh, using fossil fuels. So hence, nuclear energy might provide the answer. Uh, the, uh, it's interesting to note that the world AI robotics industry is expected to hit about $2 trillion a year by 2030. And so the dollar scale for dealing with the problems seems to be about right. Right now, I have to admit, I don't have any clear idea about how to proceed with all of this. Uh, but it's a very wide path, and there uh, would seem to be a whole bunch uh, of potential options. So thank you for your, your attention and participation. I hope these sessions were useful. Well, I'm sure there should be some commentary. <laughs> Al. Well, I'm particularly interested in your last remarks there. Even before AI came to uh, being, it seems to me we've been on a number of trajectories that are not sustainable. The concentration of the power of capital over everybody else. And so, uh, I kind of foresee in the next decade or so, probably after I'm not here to look around and see it, that we're going to have a major reorganization of societies. It may not be pleasant, but it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should uh, add the, uh, the, the top seven companies <laughs> In, in the United States, increase their
value in the stock market by 75% during just last year. So they are now, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I've got the number right, but I think it was something like 40% of the total wealth of the country is tied up in these seven largest companies. Jerry, the, uh, the morning paper has uh, stories about uh, the impact of AI on uh, the political uh, election. On the, on the election coming on the election. forward? Yeah. Uh, it seems rather uh, that we could be overwhelmed by a wave of uh, misinformation. Uh, is there, are, there, are there any counter events that might uh, take place? I, I didn't catch Are there any responses or counter uh, forces uh, to that? Boy, I, if there are, I don't know of any other than individual vigilance, you know, by, by persons to keep paying attention to whether the stuff that I'm looking at uh, is likely to or not. <coughs> I don't really know <clears throat> what, what to do about it. I mean, uh, how can you... Uh, I guess there's such a discussion, uh, such... Uh, what should I say? Such a difference in what people believe is true. I mean, if you believe that the January 6th was actually a peaceful uh, uh, visit by interested citizens to the to the Capitol uh, in, in, uh, on January 6th, uh, so be it. But there are others looking at the pictures come to a very different conclusion. One of, one of the possibilities is that there will be uh, thousands and thousands of new news sources that will overwhelm the environment. Um, senior group like this had time to do <clears throat> several hours of reading on the subject per week. Uh, how would you, what would you recommend besides the obvious New York Times and, and uh, Wall Street Journal? Well, if you want to learn about AI, there is the textbook. <laughs> a, a thousand and forty pages uh, that you uh, could, but uh, it's a, a really a very tough slog, and and uh, and though it was, uh, I think the most recent issue uh, was published in 2022. It's seriously out of date. So it, it really seems that. Uh, uh, the AI situation keeps changing so rapidly that you really have to keep yourself informed by various current uh, uh, sources uh, of information. And I frankly couldn't tell you right off uh, of anything besides, say, the New York Times, uh, the, Wall, the Wall Street Journal is fairly <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> factual, even if you don't, <coughs> excuse me, uh, agree with its, uh, often with, it, with its uh, orientation. Uh, and I just keep, just keep, boy, I, you know what? I, I, I think I'll do the following. Uh, about every two months, uh, I'll give you a talk <laughs> about what's going on uh, uh, with AI. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a certain act of vanity on my part, but uh, I, 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 I'll give it a go uh, because I think I, I don't know of a single source that I could uh, direct you to. Yeah. Well, I think Doug's question goes way beyond AI. I think he's concerned about misinformation uh, being just so available. And you know, there's probably a little elite of us who uh, 
use our head and sort it out. And it's interesting that our university, probably others, are giving courses on how to detect misinformation. It's kind of shoveling against the tide with a teaspoon, but it, at least it's something. Yeah, well, I mean, before there was AI, let, let me remind you of the financial debacle in 2007. Remember uh, collateralized debt obligations? Yeah. Uh, those were things sold you by Goodman, uh, by Goodman Sachs and, and uh, other uh, operations like that. So he, misinformation and, and, uh, uh, and, and stuff like that uh, isn't unique uh, uh, to, uh, a, from AI. Uh, there have been sources of misinformation going on forever. Uh, and it's just a question that there's somewhat more means to distributing it. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I don't... This information is not new. <laughs> How oh, it's possible to prevent people from believing phony stuff that could be produced, whether, whether by AI or not, is uh, almost impossible. When you consider the fact that I read in the paper that some 35% of Americans believe in angels or in ghosts, or I forget exactly why. But it's, it's like, how, how can you help it if people are so ignorant? Geez, well, don't you believe that stuff? <laughs> I, I, I don't believe in ghosts. Believe in angels? A, a, angels are another matter. <laughs> One way to look at that, Henry, is the old saying, perception equals reality. You, you may have one perception of what's real in the world and somebody else has one. And the question is, which one is real? Hmm. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> you're not getting away with that. Right? That, that, that. Which one is real? What does real mean, sir? Let me give you an example. <laughs> I did a lot of work with uh, communities that had uh, cancer cases. They had a toxic waste site in the community. Uh, the question is, did the toxic waste site cause the kids' cancers? Was a couple of examples. From a scientific point of view, the answer was no. From the point of view of the parents of those kids, their reality was that the toxic waste site, in fact, caused the cancer. Yeah. There's no way that a scientist, if you will, can convince people that what they believe to be real is not real. So the, the, the real question is, who's, whose perspective are you taking? If you take the scientific perspective, you have one reality, but if, if you're a family, a child, whatever, your, your reality is your reality. Are you ready for another comment? Sure. Uh, I'm going back to the, this item in today's paper about communicating with the dead. Yes. And the role of AI in it. Uh huh. I actually think there's a positive. The, 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 as I read that article, the communication with the dead was facilitated by having recorded comments about the person who died, more than just comments. And that they, when the, the, in the, the living individual who had close association with the dead, I think in this case it was a woman and her father or husband, AI was able to sort through the recordings of what the dead 
that now that person had left behind. And so he responded to the woman's questions by feeding the voice and the information of a dead person to that individual. It was, it was, I mean, I'm as skeptical as anybody about speaking, uh, communicating with the dead. I, I used to be, but now I'm a little less skeptical. <laughs> Could you tr try to clarify what you mean by communication? Well, uh, I, what I mean is that just getting wisdom from the, the <coughs> deceased individual, the wisdom that was left behind in the yeah. recorded messages. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, AI just helped. Yeah, and, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't need AI to do that for you. Uh, and the only way you would need AI is, I imagine, if you somehow could use the capability that AI has has developed in reconstructing human voice, yeah. and, and then have provided it with uh, uh, recording a sufficient amount of data <laughs> that it could replicate the voice of that person and then you could give it some new messages uh, that it could communicate. I mean, I can understand that. Well, uh, but but it's, a, it's certainly one-way communication. I think that's more or less what they did. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, Joan wants to know where, where you see uh, uh, the universities fitting into uh, the understanding and the uh, use of AI. Well, what can I say? I mean, it's clear that m many of the people involved are, are trained in, 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 in uh, universities in computer science and, uh, and the like. Uh, there's not much that goes on in AI that is now being developed in universities. Uh, that, that, that development is largely in, in, in the private sector and, and the reason is it, it is uh, driven uh, at, uh, unfortunately, by commercial considerations. So, uh, I don't quite know how to address. Do you see the potential then for the setting up of uh, uh, units like the Berkeley Labs uh, at different uh, or at several key universities? Or is even that uh, oh, behind? Okay. So, uh, uh, I, I think we're getting uh, to the issue right now. So, the resources that you need, uh, especially with regard to training these uh, uh, large language uh, models, uh, involves a, 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 an amount of computing that runs into hundreds of millions of dollars. So, it's very hard for universities to uh, uh, basically uh, do anything about that. Now, what you could use, uh, and I think you hit on it, uh, was at the large national laboratories. There are computing resources, but most of those computing resources are, are set up as uh, in terms of GPUs. Uh, uh, not GPUs, CPUs. Uh, computing uh, processing units and, and, and the parallel processing that you need associated with graphic computing units is something that the labs don't invest in. Yeah. Well, I think an issue here could be application rather than development of AI on universities. I mean, they're already worrying about uh, 
term papers and writing lectures and all this sort of stuff. And I think that's a huge area that universities could exploit. Well, uh, probably not one you still in that. There are private companies doing that now for professors. Yeah, but I think universities could say, hey folks, uh, we got an AI 101, application of AI 101. Uh, I, I think yeah. AI 101 probably uh, would be better taught by open AI or, or, or deep mind than any university. <laughs> well, I think you're missing my point. It's the application, not the development. I mean, kids are already using this. Profs are already using this. Write lectures. Okay. Uh, Disseminating information. Uh huh. What exactly is a tensor processing unit? Does it have anything to do? What does it have to do with tensors? Or what is yes, a tensor it, processing it, unit? It, it's just really good at matrix multiplication. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't tell you much more than that, Henry. Uh, but it's possible to design a chip that can do multiplication of, of large matrices, most of whom's elements are zero. Uh, uh, and uh, if you go at it with a general, uh, with a computer processing thing, it would take forever. Uh, uh, but these things, uh, are able to uh, figure out shortcuts for doing matrix multiplication of these very strange kinds of very, very large matrices. I'm talking about things that are t typically 10,000 by 10,000 with a lot of zeros. <laughs> Sounds like nothing. Yes, right there. Okay. Well, thank you very much.